Now, we're going to move on to Daniel chapter 12 and um, this very sober verse, Daniel 12, verse 2. So take your Bibles, take the handout that was in your worship guide, and let's pause and um, pray. Our Father, as we come to your word now, it's another one of those texts, those sermons that reminds us how uh, powerless we are without the Spirit of God working in our hearts. We are so, so good at being calloused about our sin and how we are so desperately in need of your Spirit opening the eyes of our hearts to see the disgrace, the shame, the contemptibleness of our sin. And so we are crying out for the Spirit today, not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit. It's the only way these truths land in our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Daniel 12, verse 1, from last Sunday. At that time, so during the time of the final terrible ruler, before Jesus comes again, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. So that's Revelation chapter 12, the archangel Michael against warring against the devil in heaven, three and a half years before Jesus comes again. Verse 1 continues, And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So there will be a time of great trouble before Jesus comes again, and at the, at the end of that future tribulation, there apparently will be, first of all, a spiritual deliverance, a great revival, a great salvation, especially of the remnant of the Jewish people, and then there will be a physical deliverance of those same people as Jesus comes again and rescues them from the power of the Antichrist. Verse 2 goes on now to tell us that there will also be a resurrection of the dead. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So when Jesus comes again, there will be resurrection, but not just a resurrection of God's people to everlasting life, also the resurrection of unsaved people to shame and everlasting contempt. In the weeks ahead, we'll talk more about resurrection to eternal life, but this morning I want us to just sit a little while with these sober words of God, some will awake to shame and everlasting contempt. So back up to the beginning of verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So number one, all people will be resurrected. Now, I realize that the word at the beginning of verse 2 there is the word many, not all. Um, and there are a couple possible reasons for that. One of them is it may say many because this is just one phase of the resurrection. We'll talk at Bible study about some of the, the other phases of the resurrection. But we know from many other passages in the Bible that in the end, all people will be resurrected. Acts 24 verse 15 says that there will be a resurrection of both the just and and the unjust. And Jesus said in John 5, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. That's the voice of the Son of Man, of Jesus. And they will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So all people will be resurrected. Daniel 12, 2 pictures this as sleeping and then waking. Sleep is a common picture for death in the Bible, and that makes sense because of the doctrine of resurrection. From our human perspective, death seems so final. It's not sleep, it's death. But in truth, death is not final, even for our bodies, because everyone is going to be resurrected. Our bodies go to sleep, but then God wakes them up in resurrection. Now, this is not talking about soul sleep, it's not talking about our souls sleeping until resurrection. The Bible says that if believers are not here in these bodies, then they are with God. They're part of that heavenly gathering described in Hebrews 12 and Revelation 4, 5, 6, 7. They're in paradise, like Jesus told the thief on the cross. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we're not talking here about soul sleep. 
We're talking about the fact that your body is going to die and yet someday be resurrected. The bodies of all people. Now, this does not mean that the bodies of all people are going to be resurrected in the same way or to the same type of body. The body of those who have been redeemed in Christ are resurrected to everlasting life, and that body is glorious. It is filled with God's Spirit. It is imperishable, and it is powerful. It will be like Christ's resurrection body, we read in 1 Corinthians 15. The body of those who don't have eternal life will not be a glorious body like that. And we don't, that's, we don't, mystery, we don't know anything beyond that. But they will be resurrected nonetheless. All people will be resurrected. Now, why? Simply to stand before God. You remember that Daniel 7 pictured a heavenly courtroom with the Ancient of Days presiding as judge. And in that chapter, it was the terrible final ruler who's brought into that courtroom. But what the rest of the Bible tells us is that all people will stand there before God. That's what Daniel 12 implies when it says, they awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those two eternal paths are set in the courtroom before the throne of God. There is a judgment and there is a sentence. Revelation chapter 20 is in your handout. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. All people will be resurrected and enter their eternal destiny in a body. This is because we live in a just universe created by a holy and just God. Justice is not always done in this life. But it will be done because all people will be resurrected to stand before God. Every sin will be fairly judged. You see, if there is no way for a person to receive justice after this life, then there is nearly no justice at all. Because if you're rich enough to bribe the justice system, then you can do whatever you want. If you're clever enough, if you're powerful enough, then you can dominate others. You can do all the evil and harm you want, and it doesn't matter. You're going to get away with it just fine. Because if there is no resurrection, you're just going to die like everyone else, and that's it. And you got away with whatever you got away with. In other words, in the evolutionary worldview, there is no justice. There is no accountability. The most heinous of crimes actually mean nothing because there's just survival of the fittest. But in reality, there will be justice. And you may not get any of it in this life, but you will get it because this life is not the end. It's actually just the beginning. All people will be raised to stand before God and then enter a bodily eternity Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So that's number one, all people will be resurrected. Number two, some people will be resurrected to shame and contempt. That's what Daniel 12, verse 2 says. It would be more comfortable to just skim over that and keep going, but let's stop and make sure we hear what God is saying. Let's consider what else the Bible says about the shame and contempt. First of all, this shame and contempt is unnatural. It is not the way people were before sin. 
and it is not the way people are supposed to be. You see what I'm saying? Both of these words in Daniel 12.2 might be translated disgrace, and disgrace is not supposed to be the banner flying over all of humanity. What should it be instead? The banner of grace, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. The label on humanity is not supposed to be dishonor. These are human beings created in the image of God. It's supposed to be honor that rests upon them. So how did these unnatural things of shame and contempt come to characterize humanity created in the image of God and good? Well, turn with me to Romans chapter 1 because it explains it very clearly. First of all, we bring this shame and this contempt upon ourselves by discarding God. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And down to verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. We discard God we don't honor him. We don't give him thanks. Instead, we trade him for earthly things. There is no way to illustrate this fully in human terms, but maybe you've been in a situation in which you've gotten badly scammed and you've given money or something else very significantly and gotten nothing in return. That is embarrassing. We do not like to tell other people about that. How much more so when what we have done is discarded God and exchanged him for the perishable stuff of this life. That brings shame and contempt upon us. It is disgraceful. Then we cause this shame and contempt by our sin. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. We cause it by our sin. Proverbs 18.3 says, When wickedness comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes disgrace. In other words, sin dishonors us. Other verses say that sin stains, defiles, corrupts, damages. How about this in Proverbs chapter 6? He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. That's the, that's the, the voice of wisdom in Proverbs saying, why would you do this to yourself? Why would you disgrace yourself like this? Sin is never harmless. It brings shame and contempt whether we realize it, whether we feel it or not. But then there is another step in Romans 1. Thirdly, we cause this shame and contempt by our idols. Verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Now, I just made the point that it's, it's shameful and disgraceful to make a trade like that. But the point here is that the Bible says that when we give ourselves over to idols, when we give ourselves over to empty things, we become like them, which means we become what? Empty. You give yourself to an empty thing and you become empty. Psalm 115 verse 8, talking about idols, it says those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. We become like what we worship. And so when we give our time, our money, our eyes, our hearts, our attention, our priorities to shameful things, they make us shameful. To empty things, they make us empty. To disgraceful things, they bring disgrace upon us. 
So we bring the shame and contempt upon ourselves because we discard God, we embrace sin, and we worship idols. But there is another point in Romans 1. Verse 26 tells us that God allows it. It says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And that phrase, God gave them up, is used in verses 24, 26, and 28. We could translate it, God abandoned them, God let them go, God delivered them over, God left them to their sinful ways. It's as if we say, God, leave me alone. And God says, okay, I will let you take the course of sin. And the result is shame and contempt. And then, finally, society celebrates it. Verse 32 in Romans 1, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Philippians 3.19 says, They glory in their shame. And so this is how human beings created honorably in God's image become full of disgrace. Now, turn back to Daniel chapter 12. So we've just learned about how shame and contempt are unnatural. Next, we want to dig a little deeper into what these words mean. And I've summarized that with point be on your handout. This shame and contempt is more than embarrassment. It's not just saying that we will stand before God on judgment day and say, yeah, I wasn't exactly perfect, made some mistakes. This is far more serious than that. It's not like taking a burnt quiche out of the oven and being a little embarrassed that you burn it. And there are several reasons why we know this. First, the word shame in Daniel 12.2 is an intensive plural for great shame. And also, these words, as they're used in the Old Testament, they really aren't about my personal internal feelings, like feeling embarrassed. These words are about my reputation, what other people know me to be. So let me just give you a few examples of how the word shame is used. Not all of these parallel our passage. That's not my point. I'm trying to show us just kind of the idea of the word. This word is used when Leah looks down on Rachel or even mocks Rachel because she couldn't conceive. It's used for Nahash bringing disgrace upon the Israelites by gouging their eyes out. It's used for the heartbreaking shame when Tamar was raped. It's used for the nations who mocked Israel when they were defeated and sent into exile, like Babylon did. The psalmists talk about their foes taunting them using this same word. When Goliath kept coming out to taunt Israel, the little shepherd boy David says, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, hey, why are we letting him reproach Israel? That's the same word. So you see from those examples that these words, shame and contempt, they aren't just about like my personal feeling of something like embarrassment. These include things like blame, guilt, mockery, dishonor, and disgrace. So when Daniel 12.2 says that some will awake to shame and everlasting contempt, don't picture someone blushing a little bit. Picture deep, crushing disgrace upon that person. Thirdly, this shame and contempt will be experienced at the judgment in the presence of God. It won't just be a private feeling I have on my own, by myself, but we will personally stand before God and fully understand that we are guilty. Do you know, it's going to be in a, in a moment, it will be so obvious that all of our rationalizations and excuses and denials were nonsense. For our whole lives, those rationalizations ran through our mind and heart, and sometimes we believe them, but suddenly they will be nonsense, and we'll know it. Also, all of the ways that I felt better by comparing myself to other people will suddenly be gone. No thought of it at all. All of the things I successfully hid in this life will appear 
and all that will be left is me and God and the cold, hard facts of my sin. And for all who stand at that judgment in shame and contempt, it will also be clear that they rejected Christ and that it is too late. That their greatest sin was their refusal to repent and believe the good news and come follow Jesus. Revelation 1, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Because it's too late. And there he is. But it gets worse because it won't end. This shame and contempt will continue for eternity. Think of it in three stages. First, we become shameful and contemptible by our sin and idols in this life. Then we stand before God in shame and contempt. And then we begin an eternity of shame and and contempt. And to the demon in the sound system, we ask you to leave. Why is my thing crackling? The lie is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. The truth is what happens in Vegas stays with you for eternity. The lie is what happens on your phone stays on your phone. The truth is what happens on your phone stays with you forever. We will awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so finally, this shame and contempt is the judgment of God. In other words, it's not just something that we do to ourselves, though that's true. And it's not just something that we feel because of our sin, though that's also true, but it is also a sentence from God in the courtroom. You are sentenced to shame and eternal contempt. Psalm 75, 66, then the Lord put his adversaries to rout. He put them to everlasting shame. God does this. For example, in our, in our context of the book of Daniel, think about the Babylonians. They defeated Israel. They stole from Israel's temple. They mocked Israel's God. They enslaved God's people. And it looked like they got away with it. But you could go read Isaiah 47 verses 1 through 4 and see where God promises that he will personally bring disgrace upon the Babylonians. Antiochus IV threw Jewish babies off the walls in Jerusalem. We can be sure God will bring shame and contempt upon him. God will bring shame and contempt on the Jewish kings like Manasseh who burned their babies in the fire and on the shooter who gunned down students at Michigan State this week. But it won't only be the big headlines. It will also be the quiet, hidden evils behind closed doors. Because God created mankind in his image. No person can ever sin against another person without God seeing, God knowing, and God determining that he will bring justice in his time. God will give eternal shame and contempt for every wrong done to others. And every one of us has wronged others. God will also give eternal shame and contempt to all of those who have sinned directly against him, even if it didn't involve anyone else. All of us who have ignored him, dishonored him, disobeyed him, failed to give him thanks. There are no exceptions to what I'm saying. What we're describing here is not just for the especially bad people. It's not just for the worst crimes. Now, God may deliver them to even more severe judgments. I don't know. And yet, when a holy God looks on every single one of us, he sees a sinner clothed in the shame and contempt of our sin, guilty before him. And he will justly give us the sentence of eternal shame and contempt, and we will not argue back because it will be so obvious that it is just and right. Ian DeGuid writes, Many of our friends and neighbors go through life with no thought for the final resurrection and the day when they will stand before God to give an account for their lives. Who else is going to share that news with them? 
who is in a better position to speak to them of the power and sovereignty of a holy God, the seriousness of the last judgment, and their need to live their lives in the light of eternity. And yet it might even be you sitting here in a church service this morning. You might be one of those whose thoughts are shaped entirely by present realities rather than ultimate realities. You might be the one coming to church and yet actually discarding God, loving sin, trading God for the things of the world, gambling that there will not be a final resurrection and judgment and eternity. It is necessary for every single person to fear God. Jesus said, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. There are no exceptions. Only people who are fooled gamblers. There are no exceptions. However, there is redemption. Number three, this shame and contempt is redeemable. There is glorious good news, but you must understand that the opportunity for redemption is only now in this life. Roman Catholicism teaches purgatory. The Bible does not. The Mormon church teaches a system of baptism by which you have a second opportunity to accept Christ after this life. The Bible does not teach that. Indian religions teach reincarnation, which give you more opportunities to find enlightenment and liberation. The Bible does not. Now, in this life, you must respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. Once he comes again, it is too late. And that's why he says, you're not going to know when I'm coming again. You cannot gamble on seeing, knowing, figuring it out, and just at the last second, squeaking in a little fake repentance. Your opportunity for redemption is now. And when I use the word redemption, we sang that word many times this morning, we're not talking about redeeming yourself, like a football player who misses a field goal early in the game, and then later in the game, he gets another chance to redeem himself. That's not what we're talking about. This redemption is accomplished completely by Jesus Christ and received by us entirely as a free gift. And in a moment, I'll talk about how that redemption is provided. But first, remember that to receive this redemption, you have to believe what God says about sin and judgment. You have to believe his warnings. In other words, you can't take everything that's already been shared in the sermon this morning and say, well, I don't really believe all that stuff about sin and guilt and judgment and hell and so forth, but I don't mind Jesus. I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm cool with Jesus. In other words, you can't take this and be like, okay, um, I'm, uh, I'm good with point one, that's fine, and I'm good with point three, I just don't like point two. I'm okay with resurrection and redemption, just not with judgment. No, you can't have Jesus if you don't believe what God's word says about sin and death and judgment. You cannot have him. I think about the 80% of American politicians who claim to be Christians of some sort. Now, some of them truly are, of course, I get that. But you know, one of the ways who, how you could tell who is probably genuine, by their response to point two in today's sermon. Not that they're in a church that would preach that. But some of those who would claim to be Christians would hear this sermon and they would be extremely upset about point two. And they would say, get that stuff out of here. Get Romans 1 out of here. Get judgment and guilt and all that stuff out of here. I don't believe any of that. Yet they have their little Jesus card and their little ticket to heaven. No, they don't. In love and mercy, God warns us about everlasting shame and contempt. And we have to believe those warnings or we will be fooling ourselves when we claim to be Christians. Now, what is the good news of Jesus? Why is redemption possible for shameful and contemptible people? And this is so marvelous because it is not just that God says, oh, I feel sorry for you and you're a big mess, but I'm going to overlook it and come on, you can come to heaven anyways. You shameful and contemptible person. He did something so much greater than that, he actually took away our shame and contempt. God loved us so much that he sent his only son to be treated with shame and contempt during his life and then to die on the cross for our sin, bearing our sin and our shame and our contempt. 
Mark 9, verse 12. How is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Luke 23, 11, Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. And in one of the Psalms that points ahead to Jesus on the cross, the psalmist says, but I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. He lived a life of contempt and shame, but then he died. Now, we're going to read Isaiah 53 next. Don't start reading it yet. These words are familiar for some of you, very familiar for some of you. But can we read them today with the mindset of a person trembling in our sin? Think of it like this. And again, there is no human illustration that can even get close to this. But think of an athlete that at the, the most important moment of the most important game of his entire career, he not only blows it, but he blows it in an embarrassing and shameful way, like forgets a rule. And his team loses everything they've worked for. And he is left on the field, on his knees, his head covered in just complete shame and embarrassment. And he wishes more than anything else in the world, he could just disappear. Now, take that and multiply it times a thousand for the shame and disgrace of a sinner who finally, by the Spirit, understands how disgraceful he is before God. And just wants to disappear more than anything in the world. Okay, so there they are on the ground, head in their hands, so shameful and disgraceful in their sin. Can we sneak the Bible under them, right? Isaiah 53, right under their, their, their hung head in shame. And can we read it like that? Feel the weight of sin crushing down upon you and suppose you've never read of the Savior in Isaiah 53. And here's what we read about him. Isaiah 53, verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. Okay, that means because they see him as a contemptible person. They're embarrassed to be associated with him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. The, the crowds looked on Jesus and concluded that he was a shameful person being shamefully punished by God. What does it say next? But he was pierced for our transgressions. Yes, he was being shamefully punished by God, but it was for our sin, not his own. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There are no exceptions, but there is redemption because there is a redeemer. And you see here, God did not just look on us and say, oh, it'll be okay. I'll let you into heaven anyways. That would be injustice. No, God himself said, let me take away your shame and contempt by sending a savior who will bear your sin in your place so that your shame and contempt are not just overlooked, not just ignored, not just hidden, not just crammed in the closet, but gone. And you stand before the holy God in honor and in grace. And he's not just pretending. He means it because the shame and the contempt are gone. Because your sin is gone. Page turn to Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's talking about all the people who have put their faith in Jesus before us. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. 
and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he despised the shame. He counted it a trivial, inconsequential thing. What was the joy that was set before him? It was to accomplish the Father's will and save you. The joy that was set before him was the joy of redeeming sinners by his death on the cross. And because of that joy, he despised the shame. He wasn't going to let your shame and contempt deter him from his purpose to save you. He shamed the shame for the joy of breaking your chains of sin, the joy of clearing your record of guilt before God, the joy of being your advocate before the Father in the judgment, the joy of bringing you to God, the joy of preparing a place for you so that you can be with him forever. So when Jesus died on the cross in our place as the substitute for our sin, he removed our shame and contempt legally. If we repent and believe the good news, we are no longer guilty before God. We no longer have anything to fear at judgment. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus paid it all, which wipes the record completely clean. Now, we will still experience shame and contempt in this life. We will feel it sometimes because of our own sin. We will feel it because other people mistreat us. But regardless, at the resurrection, we'll be free from shame and contempt entirely. The cross frees us from shame and contempt legally. The resurrection frees us from shame and contempt entirely and forever. Have you believed the bad news so that you could then believe the good news? Have you accepted the bad news about the shamefulness of your sin before a holy God? About the justice of an eternity of shame and contempt for you? Have you believed the bad news so that you might then come and be astonished to discover a Savior who took it all for you and offers you an everlasting life as a free gift? I want to finish with these beautiful words of God to Israel through the prophet Zephaniah. Israel was full of shame and contempt. Daniel actually says that. Daniel 9, verse 16. Daniel said to the Lord, we have become a byword. That's an object of ridicule among all who are around us. But listen to this beautiful promise of what it would be like when they had repented and turned to the Lord and been redeemed. Zephaniah 3. Sing aloud. O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. I was reading in Isaiah chapter 16 this week, and I was reminded that joy and laughter and celebrating and shouting and singing and rejoicing are the way human life is supposed to be. That's normal. It's sin that tears things up and brings all this shame and sorrow and sadness and depression. Sing, shout, rejoice. This is what God restores. Verse 15, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. So you've got nothing to fear at the judgment. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. How honoring is it to have the Lord with you? Remember Isaiah 53? We hid our faces from him, didn't want to have anything to do with him. That is not what God does with redeemed sinners. He says, here, I want to be with you. And isn't that who Jesus is? He's Emmanuel, God with us. The end of verse 15, you shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst a mighty one who will save. And now watch for the honor in the next phrases. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Who, who's the actor in all those phrases? God. Verse 18. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. That's our word shame from Daniel 12. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. 
and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Man. Earlier, we followed the progression of Romans 1. Human beings created in the image of God to know God and glorify God. And this progression of degradation, sin, making them, making us more and more shameful and contemptible, leading finally to eternity of shame and contempt. Zephaniah traces the exact opposite progression from shame and contempt to praise and glory and honor and everlasting life because of Jesus. That is what God delights to do for every shameful sinner who will humbly come to him through Jesus and receive the free gift of eternal life. Sin is a progression of more and more disgrace leading to the courtroom of God and then into an eternity of shame and contempt. Redemption through Christ brings more and more honor and grace for all of eternity in the God, in the presence of the God who loves you rejoices over you with gladness. What a Savior. All right. This is the kind of sermon where it is easiest to just move on. Right? I mean, that was a good ending. But that point two, aren't you glad we didn't just stop after point two? But beware lest you just kind of move on from point two. We did not move on from point two. Point three only makes sense in the light of point two. There is no point three without point two. So in just a moment, I'm going to have Heidi Jean come and play. And I'm going to give you just a couple minutes just to sit before the Lord with these truths. That will, what goes on in your mind and heart is going to depend on what God's doing in your mind and heart. You might... You might, uh, you might say to yourself, okay, it was going to be a lot more comfortable to not come tonight to evangelism training, but I think maybe I really ought to just come. You might start writing down some names of people that you really need to invite to that seminar April 16th. In other words, you might find God working in your heart and saying, I, I can't keep my mouth shut about life and hope anymore. But you also might need to ask yourself, You might need to ask God, would you show me the disgracefulness of my sin? Because I think I don't care. Would you show me the justice of eternal shame and contempt for my sin? Because I think I don't believe it. So whatever it is that you need to talk to the Lord about in your heart, we'll just give you a couple minutes to do that. Don't run from these truths.